That's why I like cats. Cats are more like, hey, what are you up to? Uh, never mind, I just remembered I don't care. Uh, <laughs> cat person, are there any other cat people out there? Yeah, got some cat people here? Nice, I'm guessing the rest of you are dog people. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm not anti-dog, you yeah. Every time I tell someone I'm a cat person, I'm like, what does that mean, you don't like dogs? No, that's not what that means. It just means I like other people's dogs. I like dogs, I just like them over there. And I'll play with them, but then go back over there. I don't like that kind of energy in my house. You know what I mean? That annoying dog, best friend in your face all the time energy, just like, yeah! I love you! <laughs> You're home, where have you been? <laughs> it creeps me out, I don't care for that. I don't like that at all. <laughs> Just in your face. Like, you want to go out? There's a tree. I know this tree. You want to hang out at this tree? What if I just keep breathing into your face? <laughs> Ugh. All the time? No, thank you. That's why I like cats. Cats are more like, hey, what are you up to? Uh, never mind. I just remembered I don't care. Uh, I'll be in the kitchen. I'll see you later. I like that. I don't need a best friend at the house. I just need like an apathetic roommate <laughs> that sometimes wants to hang out. <laughs> like a dog, you can pet a dog's belly all day. They'll never get tired of it, just all day. Just like, yeah, man, never stop. You're the best. <laughs> Hopefully not that creepy, but you get the idea. A cat, you can pet for what? Two, maybe three seconds? And so it's like, all right, get away from me. I my own thing's going on. I got a pile of clean laundry to lay on. Get away from me. That's what my cat does. It waits for the pile of clean laundry we haven't folded yet and just rubs on it while making eye contact. Just like, mm-hmm. Everyone's gonna know. <laughs> so bothersome. My wife, uh, she has a new hobby. She's really into special needs animals. I don't know if that's made its way out here or Provo. <laughs> If you don't know what special needs animals are, they're animals. Uh, they have special needs. <laughs> that is all. Uh, there, there's this one, Oscar the Blind Cat. It was a cat that was born without any eyes, and they have a like page on Facebook, and my wife goes on there every day and cries. <laughs> and that's what she does for fun. That's what she does for a good time. And it's weird, because I come home, and she's just on the computer, like, ah! And you know, me being a guy, I always think it's something I did. <laughs> and then she goes, no. And then she turns the computer and it's Oscar the blind cat. And she's like, look at Oscar. And he's adorable. He has no eyes. Just... <laughs> and I'm like, oh. And then she goes, I want a special needs animal. I want one. I'm like, you don't ask for one. You get bestowed one. Because I don't know, what, what do you, you can't just go to the pound and be like, hey, hey, what do you have in the back? Like, that's not how that works. <laughs> I need like a three-legged dog or a cat with something. What do you have? You can't do that. That's why, you know, we got Jessica at the pound. That's where we got Jessica. And we didn't name her Jessica. They named her at the pound. And people always ask, like, why don't you change your name? Because that's wrong. You don't change someone's name. That's rude. Like, if you adopt a kid from another country, you, think you can't just be like, yep, can't pronounce that. Your name's Jeff now. <laughs> That's rude. You learned that person's name. So I got a cat named Jessica. <laughs> Very much your fan. Uh, Jessica's overweight. She weighs uh, more than she should for a cat, uh, which sucks, because when people come over, no one blames the cat in that scenario. <laughs> You know what I mean? No one comes over and goes, what happened here, sweetheart? A little heavy on the carbs? No, they look at you and they go, what'd you do to her? <laughs> and that's not fair, because I try. We have the laser pointer. I got the stick with the feather. I'm always running around my house. Come on, sweetheart, let's get the cardio going. But she's not that into it. We, my wife and I, we bought diet formula kibble. They make diet formula kibble and they have rules. Just one cup per day, because you're on a diet, Jessica. <laughs> We tried, but then at two in the morning, Jessica would come into our bedroom at night, climb onto our bed, and then stand on my head. 22 and a half pounds of her, you guys, on my skull. And she would come down into my ear and just go, meh, meh. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, this diet is over. I had no idea that's how you felt about it. I apologize. <laughs> I'm getting up right now and cooking you some bacon. Let's get after it. 
I don't have any children, but if I'm, in pu I'm out in public and I see a parent of an overweight child, I make eye contact and I go, I get it. <laughs> Does that little fella stand on your head at night and scream in your ear? <laughs> I get it, give him what he wants. We need our sleep. <laughs> My wife and I, we sleep on a memory foam mattress. That's what we sleep on. Anyone else here rocking the memory foam mattress? It's the best mattress in the world. It's the most comfortable, isn't it? It's the best. That mattress is made for sleeping and sleeping only. Don't do anything else on that mattress. It was not created for that. That is not why scientists came together. It was made for resting comfortably, and that is it. I know, because we've tried, and it sucks every time. It's like trying to wrestle in quicksand. It is the worst. You just start sinking in slowly. Stay calm, stay calm. Just try to get your leg out. Just breathe, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes on the horizon. Try to get your leg out. Get your leg out. I'm gonna get some help. Jessica, we need some help. She can't help. She just stands on our backs and pushes us in further. I'm very happy to be here. This is my first time in Provo. Uh, yeah, it's nice. It's very nice. Everyone's very friendly and they smile a lot and it's creepy all at the same time. <laughs> Everybody smiles at you, but not everybody blinks. I've noticed that. <laughs> Have you guys talked about that problem? There should be a city hall meeting or something like, guys, remember to blink. We're scaring the tourists. <laughs> it's just a bunch of people walking by going. <laughs> I was waiting for one of them to come up to me and just say something creepy, just like, the sun never sets. <laughs> and just, just like something like that, like, oh! I should have gotten a rental car. All right. It's very nice. I like it. I've, I'm new to Utah as a, as a whole. I've never been out of here. It's nice. It's, it's very white. You guys, uh, everyone else is trying to do this diversity thing. You guys are like, nope, none of that. We're going to keep it pretty white here. <laughs> it's a nice change of pace from everybody else. I like that. You guys march to your own drum. I dig that very much. This might be where white people come from, Provo, for all I know. Is there like a crevice up in the mountain just shoots out white people? You come out, they just hand you like a Subaru and a rescue dog, and you go live your life. And you're like, I'm ready. I'm so ready. <laughs> Very nice to be here. I, uh, like they said, I'm from San Diego. That's where I call home. San Diego, California. Yeah, I like it there. Have you been there? You grew up there. All right, nice. I don't know when the last time you were back there, but we have, uh, at our beaches, we have tsunami evacuation route signs. They're signs that tell people which way to run uh, in case there's a tsunami. <laughs> All it is is a sign about this big. It's two feet by two feet. It's blue, and it says, Tsunami Evacuation Route! And it's just an arrow that points inland. That's it. That's the entire sign. That is our tax dollars going to work in San Diego. I don't know who that sign's for. Who's that for? I know we get a lot of tourists in San Diego, but if you're a human being with natural human-like fears, and you see something big, wet, and mean coming this way, and you don't know that you should probably turn around and start hauling it the other way, then you know what? We as a society, we don't need you. We don't need that person. That was a good deal all around. We don't need that guy voting or filling out the census. No, this is perfect. I just can't imagine that person standing in the sand looking at the water, seeing this big wall of water just going, ha, ha, ha. I am befuddled. I don't know what to do. I'm gonna stand in a doorway. You better stop, drop, and roll, honey. We're gonna, we're gonna get through this. Oh, thank you. This is very sweet. I flew out here. I flew out here on United because uh, they're giving those tickets away. <laughs> That guy's a hero. Uh, we need to put him on a stamp. Everyone's summer vacation's a little bit cheaper. Thanks to him. Oh, there you go. 
I flew with a, the last time before this, I flew to Boise. I flew with a buddy of mine. I don't know if you've ever flown with someone like this. We were flying from San Diego to Boise. And before the plane took off, he crossed himself up. You know, he gave him the father, the son, the ghost of Christmas past. He hit all the corners. <laughs> but we had a connection in Oakland. We had to get on another plane in Oakland. And uh, as we're taking off, he hits it again. And I looked at him, and I go, that doesn't transfer from the first one? <laughs> You gotta hit it every time. Like, if I was doing it, I would do one big one in the morning. I'd be like, hey, hey, for everything. For it. <laughs> Whatever may come up. And he goes, no, you gotta do it every time. I'm like, all right, cool, then do it. I'm like, when you're doing it, are you praying for everybody? And he goes, of course. I'm like, you better be. Because that'd be weird, wouldn't it? This plane goes down, everyone's dead and on fire in a cornfield, except for you just sitting there, just... <laughs> Oh, I should have prayed for everybody. <laughs> I have made a giant mistake. There's gonna be a lot of questions when the authorities arrive. <laughs> I'm still scared of turbulence when I fly. I fly all the time, but I've never gotten used to that. I'm still the guy just going, ee! like I'm that guy. <laughs> Terrified. I hate it when I sit next to someone that won't acknowledge the turbulence. I was on this one flight, I had the window seat. The guy in the middle, he was reading a book but it was too turbulent to be reading. But he wouldn't let it go. He's just sitting there like this, just. <laughs> and I'm over here terrified. And he's, and we, there was one of those big drops, you know, every once in a while there's a big drop and his book went down and he just popped it back up and went right back to reading. And I was like, will you please acknowledge that our butts just dropped a thousand feet? Just give me a wink and a nod, like, yes, this is terrifying. <laughs> Just something. I do this, uh, you can try this too. I've done this to cope with the being afraid of the turbulence. I do this reverse psychology thing. So now when I'm in a plane and it gets choppy, in my head I go, yeah, take it down. Let's do it, let's put it in the ground. Let's see what you got. And then when it doesn't crash, I go, that's what I thought. <laughs> That way I felt like I was in charge. <laughs> I kept that plane in the air. <laughs> oh, it's so friendly. I love it. So I like traveling though, you get to meet different people, it's nice. Like I, here, everyone's nice, they put me in a very nice hotel. I'm not used to that. I'm not used to very, I was like, look at all these towels. What am I supposed to do with all of them? <laughs> I was in Seattle recently and I didn't have a hotel booked. I waited till the last minute. I got a hot wire thing. Like, uh, you know, you can get a good deal last minute. I got a room for $40 and I found that that is too cheap. <laughs> Everything should be more than $40. Every room anywhere. Your own mother should charge you more than $40 to crash on the couch for a night. It was such a bad situation. I went in and this is how I was welcomed to the hotel. The lady behind the counter was yelling at somebody to get out. She was like, no, you paid with cash. I don't have a card on file. Either you bring us more cash or get out. And I was like, oh, oh, this is gonna be fun. So I'm just standing there with my credit card and driver's license waiting for my turn. And as I'm waiting, a lady walks in. She brought two kids. And she's like, can I get a job application? I'd like to clean the rooms. And I'm like, what? So now I got a tear coming down. <laughs> and to add a trifecta to this situation, there was an elderly man in a wheelchair. He was missing a leg, and he's just aimlessly doing donuts in the lobby. <laughs> just not really going anywhere, just kind of doing donuts. And I'm standing there looking at all this, and I'm like, no way, there's no way. She's over there yelling, get out! She's over here, can I get an application? This poor old man, sans leg, just doing donuts. And I'm like, there's no way, there's no way this hotel has Wi-Fi. There's no way. I don't see how this adds up to me enjoying Netflix in five minutes. Sure enough, I was correct, I was right. They did not have good Wi-Fi out there. It's so fun, but that's why I like traveling, you get to meet different people. That's why I like it. I was in uh, Portland, Oregon. Anyone here from Portland? You guys are from Portland? Nice. I like it. They, their whole motto is they keep it weird over there. Right? And they're doing a good job. They're doing a good job. Go check it out. Everyone's pulling their weight in that town. <laughs> Making it weird. I did that show in Seattle and then I took the train down to Portland. And when I got to the train station, I came across a young lady who I hope was on drugs. <laughs> you ever meet anyone like that? Where you just go, ooh, I hope that's not permanent. 
I hope that was a decision. I hope you decided for that to happen. I hope you're having a great time while the rest of us are mortified for you. This is what she was doing. She was lined up against the street sign, just doing this right here, just going, ah. And I'm like, which drug is that one? I've never, I've never seen this before. I'm trying to walk by while she's doing that. She sees me and she yelled at me. She yelled at me, she goes, you look like Jesus. And I said, thank you, and I kept walking. Cause you don't slow down for that. You don't keep that conversation going. You cut that off right there. You go, thank you, you just reminded me I don't walk fast enough. I appreciate it. So I'm trying to walk off. She yelled at me again. She goes, throw me a blessing, Jesus. I was like, oh. well, I can't let my children down. Uh, I gotta throw this girl a blessing. What if this is a big day for her? What if this is where she turns her life around? Cause she got to meet who she thinks is Jesus at the Portland train station. I can't leave her hanging. This could be a monumental day in this woman's life. I have to throw her a blessing. Here's a problem though. I've never seen a blessing thrown. I've never seen it go down. Is it underhand? I've never seen it happen. So I had to think quick. I had to think on my feet. This is what I came up with. I just turned and pointed at her and went, you got it. <laughs> I threw my first blessing. <laughs> How you doing? Perfect. I love it. That's why I enjoy it so much. It's very nice. I like traveling because it brings excitement to my life because otherwise I'm a pretty boring person. I don't do much. I go to Costco. I hang out at Costco. <laughs> Any other Costco people out there? <laughs> yeah. Right? I never went as a kid because I grew up in a small family of three and you don't go when there's only three of you. You'll never be able to finish all that ketchup. It's impossible. It's not for your small family. But my wife, she grew up always going to Costco and she loves it, so she's the one that got me into going to Costco. And it's a weird place to go with adult eyes having never been there as a child. It's weird, because they give you guys samples of food that everyone already knows the taste of. And people still line up like, what? <laughs> Is that mac and cheese? Are you handing out tiny thimbles of macaroni and cheese? Oh, yes. Get up there, get your rations. They give you some little stick to eat it with. Like, mm, are you? No, oh, no. Every once in a while, someone asks the lady in the hairnet stupid questions. Did you add butter to that? Did you add butter? Is that why it's so creamy and delicious? Did you add some butter? A little bit of butter? Did you add some? No? That's just regular Kraft macaroni and cheese? Oh my. What? What? Can I get another sample? No? All right, easy, easy. We're backing away. I guess we'll just get a crate of it. They bring in a forklift and bring it down. The weirdest it's the weirdest place. It's the only place where they give you a sample this big and you're like, hmm, can we eat this forever? Can you make that happen? I'm like, oh yes, we sell it by the crate. Nothing else works that way. Nothing else works that way. You get a sample this big and you buy a pallet of it. Nothing else works that way. Imagine if other things did work that way though. Imagine if, I don't know, that's how everyone got to pick their significant others. You got a picture of this big. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's the one. Are you sure? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the one. And then they just show up, just whop. And you're like, whoa. Did you add butter to that? It's a little bit of butter. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I turned 30 uh, last month, which I'm excited about. I'm, I'm in the 30 club. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. I don't know when you start feeling like an adult. I don't know when that starts kicking in, because I definitely don't. I was at the uh, grocery store. I was picking out some jam, some preserves for my toast in the morning. I like to put jam on there. And uh, I was picking one out and the jar was slippery and it slipped through my hand and smashed on the floor. And as soon as it happened, my first thought was, run, we gotta get out of here. They're gonna know it was you. <laughs> That's not an adult. An adult stands there and calls the manager over 
goes, excuse me. And then they bring a teenager over with a mop and you stand there while you watch them clean it and you go, yes, that is how this works. <laughs> I'm gonna need to need a free jar for my troubles. That's how an adult handles it with me. I'm running through the aisle. I don't even like jam. That's what I'm yelling to try to throw them off my scent. It wasn't me. 30 is not old, but I have like an old soul. Like inside, I'm like an older gentleman. I know that because I was watching TV and the Sunsetter retractable awning commercial came on. And after the commercial, I was like, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's time for the Sunsetter. <laughs> that commercial's been on for 30 years. I've never cared about it, ever. And then now I'm like, they make some solid points. <laughs> Their shade, I like to crank things. This is all in my wheelhouse, I love it. They haven't even changed the commercial. It's still the same couple going outside with lemonade and then the sun hits them, they're like, oh no! And the voiceover comes on, like, you should get a sunset or retractable awning. It'll keep your deck and patio 20 degrees cooler. That's their whole selling point, explaining how shade works. And that's the entire commercial. It's so bizarre, but I'm in, I want it. I did another adult thing. I got a Keurig at home. I make coffee at home, which I feel like that's, an, that's a step into adulthood. Because I don't like coffee shops. That's for young people. That's for the youngins that are like, ooh, I want to go to a coffee shop. <laughs> I might meet somebody. Who knows what might happen? <laughs> but I like to make my coffee at home because I don't want to go to a coffee shop. Because it's like, ugh, I might meet somebody. <laughs> Who knows what might happen? <laughs> I totally have the reverse. I don't need to be talking to anyone until I'm awake to do so. <laughs> I can handle you now. Let's do this. So bizarre. My, uh, my wife, uh, we've been married for a couple years. Uh, it's very nice. I like being married. I wouldn't want to be single. It looks awful out there. I don't know how you do it. Everyone just has to smile a lot. I like being married because I get to be honest. We know each other, you know? We know each other, but when you're single, you always have to be on your best behavior because you don't know who's coming around the corner. It could be your soulmate. Just coming around the corner. You can't be all down in the dumps. You gotta be like, hi! Ha -ha! And I don't like that. I just like to be myself. So I enjoy being married. I cried at my wedding. Uh, I, don't know if that, I don't know if that's a shocker for the cat man. Uh... <laughs> It wasn't my fault that I cried. I'm not gonna blame me. I'm gonna blame my wife, because that's the easy thing to do. Uh, I'm gonna say it was her fault, because the day before, we're doing the walkthroughs, you know, the rehearsals and stuff, and while we're standing up at the altar, uh, she turns to me and she goes, hey, take this seriously tomorrow. And I go, yeah, okay, yeah. She's like, no, really, I don't want you hamming it up thinking you're at one of your comedy shows. This is serious. There's 15 grand on the line. Don't mess this up. So, Who are you? But I don't want to mess it up for my wife. So the next day, I'm standing there. I'm very serious. I'm like, okay, here we go. Here we go. And then, like, at that moment, I realized that everyone that was important in my life was sitting there, all dressed up for this big day. They came. And then my wife starts walking down the aisle, and she's gorgeous. And her father's walking her down the aisle, and he looks the way he does. <laughs> There's a guy off to the side playing acoustic guitar as they're coming down. And he's not playing like Metallica riffs or something hard. He's playing like butterfly kissy coffee shop music. <laughs> and all of that tornadoed into a thing. And at that moment, I realized I've been using comedy to hide my emotions my entire life. <laughs> what an awful time to find that out. <laughs> and I just started crying. Not a little bit, not like a respectable one tier. Oh, he has a heart, like ugly, like a like everything came out. Everything I never cried about before came out. There's a parakeet that died in middle school that I never fully mourned. I was like, squawker, no! Like everything came out. <laughs> Thankfully, one of my groomsmen called me a wuss during the ceremony. Just very quickly went, wuss! And I'm like, oh, he like zapped me out of it. And I was like, thank you, that is why you guys are here. I need to be a man right now and marry my wife. Stop crying like we're at an ice cream or something. <laughs> I like being married. 
my wife, she, uh, she hinted that uh, she's been hinting that she wants to have children because uh, she said, hey, I, w- I want to have kids. <laughs> now she's beating around the bush. And I go, oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> like, I'm interested in the endeavor, kind of. But I'm gonna, the, the reason I don't want kids, I'm going to blame you parents. You're not really selling me on it. <laughs> I see you out there. You're not really selling me on that purchase. You know what I do want? I want to buy a jet ski. You know why? Because I've seen other people with jet skis and they look like they're having an awesome time all the time. They're always shirtless on the water. Woo! Yeah! And I'm like, I want in on that. You know what I've never seen? Just parents hanging out with their kids, just going, yeah! These are the guys, man. Get yourself some of these. Maybe if I saw that a few times, I'd be like, we gotta look into this kid thing. Because it looks to be a ball. It's so silly. All my friends have kids, and they're really good parents, so I see what it takes to be a good parent, and I go, oh, I don't have that. Because if you're a good parent, you gotta be a good parent every day of the week. You can't take Sundays off, because then your kid won't be good. Yeah, it's a seven-day-a-week job. You just can't come out of your bedroom on a Sunday and go... Not today. Because <laughs> then you won't have a good kid. It's seven days a week. You always have to be there. Always down there. What do we say? What do we say? That man just gave you something. What do we say to that man that just gave you that? We're saying thank you. We're saying thank you. We're saying thank you. One second, sir. We're saying thank you. Open your eyes, Jeremy. We're saying thank you. One second, please. We're saying, th- uncross your arms, mister. We're saying thank you. We're saying it. We're saying thank Look at me. We're saying thank It takes a village, please, sir. We're saying. I don't have that much time. It's a lot of effort. Like, I want kids, but I want one of the good ones. You ever seen one of the not good ones? You're like, oh, that's someone's kid. <laughs> like for every like star high school quarterback, there's another one you're like, yeah, yeah, that one's mine. <laughs> oh, one of the good ones. I don't know if you can choose or you just kind of, you know, you figure it out along the way. I don't know how it works. I have a younger brother. We're uh, 13 years apart, which is kind of kind of have like a father-son dynamic going on a little bit because this is 13 years. It's quite the difference. Like when he was nine, I coached his, his youth soccer team, which was kind of weird because uh, I wasn't trying to be a coach. I was just trying to drop him off for first day of practice. And they're like, well, you're in luck. We don't have enough coaches. And I was like, what? What does that have to do with me? It was very easy to become a coach. Like, I didn't like how easy it was. They're like, you're in. I'm like, you don't want to Google me? Like, make sure I'm not like a red dot on your laptop screen first? Like, no, here's a ball. There's some kids have fun at the park. And I'm like, wow, there should be more to this than that. And I told them, I'm like, I don't even know anything about soccer. And they're like, don't worry. Here's a little 20 page pamphlet. Everything you need to know about coaching youth soccer. You know what was not in the pamphlet? what to do in case one of the kids craps their pants. <laughs> and it happened. And I'm flipping through the booklet like nothing, nothing, not even a suggestion. And I don't know what to do. I got a bunch of nine-year-olds jumping around going, Jeremy crapped his pants. And I'm over there like, Phew. I don't know, don't pass it to him. I don't know what to tell you. Take it easy on the high fives. I don't know what to tell you. We're gonna go hose them down. It's gonna be a team effort. This is gonna be nice. Let's, let's all get together. That wasn't in the pamphlet. What'd you want me to do? I had to wing it. I wasn't a good coach. I didn't know any of the rules. All their games are on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. I was like, really? These kids don't play in prime time ever? There's no Monday night soccer? <laughs> it's too early for me to coach. We actually had a good team. We went all the way to the championship game. We didn't win, but we got all the way there. Had nothing to do with my non-coaching. We had two Mexican kids that were unbelievable. (laughs) They really were. My only job as a coach was to make sure the eight other unathletic white kids got out of the way of Miguel and Jose. (laughs) 
That was my only job. That was my only job. I was like, hey, do you guys want to win? All right, well, when you see these two coming down the middle, you part like the Red Sea and you let them work their magic, okay? Those kids are playing for contracts and you guys are playing because your parents don't want to watch you two days out of the week, so let's try to win something. Oh, I got it. Well, we'll have kids one day. I'm trying to be an adult. I have been doing adult things. Like, I, last November, I voted. That was really cool. I did that. I'd never done that before, which is cool. Thank you. You don't need to clap. All right, that's fine. <laughs> I know it's not that impressive. I went in and went, Bleh. That's how I vote. And then they gave me a sticker. And I went, I got a sticker. <laughs> that was the whole voting process. I even watched all the debates, which I had never, it was my first season. I had never watched the debates before. <laughs> I hadn't watched the previous seasons. It was my first season. <laughs> I picked a weird season to jump in on. I was like... <laughs> I was like, this is what I've been missing? This is crazy. <laughs> it was a weird one. But I'm glad that I watched, because like, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. I, uh, <laughs> it's good to pay attention, because in 2012, I didn't vote for Mitt Romney. Uh, not because I knew any of his politics, but only because he had jet black hair with gray on the sides. And I grew up in the 90s, and that's every villain in every cartoon I grew up watching. And I'm like, I can't vote for that guy. He's, he's gonna poison the drinking water and try to kill the Ninja Turtles. I can't, <laughs> I can't have that on my watch. <laughs> so I watched all the debates. Those debates were so funny. The moderator, I always felt bad for the moderator because everyone kept going over their time. And he kept going, your time is up, your time is up, your time is up. He said it so many times that to a point I was like, I think he might be talking to the country. <laughs> like, he's not talking to the candidates. That's a message for us. Hey, your time is up, head for the hills. Get those canned goods in the four wheel drive. We're done here. <laughs> so odd. We voted, my voting situation was weird because I voted at my neighbor's house. I don't know if that happened to anyone else. That was my polling place, it was my neighbor's house, which kind of took the shine off the proceedings a little bit. <laughs> my wife and I, we just walked out of our house, we walked around the block, and my neighbor set it up in his garage. That did not feel official. Like, that is not how you pick the next king. This feels wrong. <laughs> I went in there, I put my Starbucks on a stack of like empty paint buckets. He gave me a Scantron with a Sharpie. I went to a booth that was snapped together with cardboard. I just remember looking at my wife going, I don't think they're counting these. Uh, <laughs> call me crazy, we're in a garage right now. <laughs> so bizarre. I didn't just vote for president, I voted on all the propositions. I read most of them. It's a lot of reading. I went in with good intentions. The first third, I read every line. I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, informed decision. The next third, I started skimming. There was some skimming that started happening. And that last third, I was just like, yes, yes, no, no. Uh, is there a C? I remember in high school, there was a C, if I didn't know. I still thought I did a fine job until we were walking home. My wife was like, hey, what'd you put for the death penalty? And I was like, ooh, that was on there? They should have put that higher up. We messed up in San Diego. Question one was like, hey, do you want the Chargers to get a new stadium? Number 85, how do you feel about killing people? <laughs> so, <laughs> a little bit. You have to be careful with the propositions because sometimes you vote stuff in, but it doesn't take action for a couple years. Like, uh, we voted to ban plastic bags in, uh, in Southern California, maybe all of it, I don't know. Uh, but it, now it kicked in, and it's weird now at the grocery store. It's weird out there, because they don't have plastic bags anymore. And they sell them for 10 cents, and that's what they sell them for now. And I don't know who these people are yelling at the cashiers, but they are so timid. When you walk up, you walk up and they go, did you, did you bring your bag? Did you, did you bring your bag? Did you bring it? Did you bring your bag? And I go, no, no I didn't, that's you guys. <laughs> I bring money, you have food and bags. That's how it, it's been this way for centuries. <laughs> and then she goes, oh, it's gonna be 10 cents for a bag. It's gonna be 10 cents. And I go, okay. I, I had no idea I was filthy rich, apparently, because it's not an issue. Like, who are these people just yelling? Oh, really? Well, then just put it back then. I'm taking my business elsewhere. 10 cents isn't slowing me down. 
But I guess since people have an issue with it, next time I'm at the grocery, I'm at the grocery store, I'm gonna throw a dollar down and I'm gonna go, hey, 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 bags for everybody. That's, <laughs> that's gonna be the new making it rain. <laughs> He just came in and threw a dollar down and made a tornado motion with his hand. He said, bags for you. He was like the Oprah of bags. You get a bag. You get a bag. Everybody gets a bag. We carried him out like Rudy. He was our champion. <laughs> so much silliness. It's weird. I, had a, uh, I don't care who you voted for. I'm going to tell my story anyway. <laughs> I, I didn't vote for Trump. And one of my best friends did, and we were talking about it. Not yelling, just talking like people, which is weird nowadays. <laughs> and he asked me, he goes, what are you so scared of? That's what he asked me. He asked me, what are you so scared of? And I was like, oh, that's a weird thing to just narrow down. <laughs> but I guess the biggest thing that scares me is that historically, nothing good has ever happened in this country when the rednecks are happy. That's the part that scares me. <laughs> And I'm not saying that can't change in the next four to eight years. I'm just saying historically, that's never been the case. Historically, anytime a large group of people go, woohoo, that's followed by centuries of the rest of us going, we are so sorry. <laughs> people are out of line, I apologize. I like it now. It's been a few months so people are more friendly about it, but it got weird there after a while. I blame the internet for that. I blame the internet. Because we argue with people you've never met before, you know? It's, it's, Facebook has taken things away. You can't have acquaintances anymore. Remember acquaintances? They're people you kind of knew. <laughs> hey, his name's Dave. Works at the hardware store. We talk about sports. And that's all you knew about Dave. And you like Dave that way. <laughs> but now you got to be Dave's friend on Facebook, and you're like, whew. <laughs> Dave is in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> I thought he just liked the Chargers, but no, there was more. There was a lot more. <laughs> you guys are fun. I have been doing more manly stuff. I know the kids are on the, next on the docket, but I also f I fixed the toilet at my house, which I'm really proud of. Thank you. Listen, I grew up without a dad, and I've rented my entire life. That means I don't fix anything. You don't fix things when you rent. That's against the rules of renting. You work around the problem until the lease is up, and then you go rent a new place with a work and whatever that is. That's how renting works. The first place I ever rented out of high school, my buddy Dane and I got an apartment and the sliding glass door came off the tracks. So we're just like, oh, that's just a big window now. That's what that is. That is no longer an enter-exit situation. That is just a big dumb window. That's what that is. My wife didn't grow up around that, so I came home from being on the road and she goes, hey baby, the toilet's hissing. And I'm like, it's hissing? She goes, yeah, it's hissing. And I was like, oh, well, we got three more months. <laughs> and then I'll find you a place without a hissing toilet. She goes, uh-uh, you gotta go fix it. And I go, why me? Why do I have to go? Neither of us know how to fix anything. Why do I gotta go in there? Why don't we both go in there with that Stanley tool set that your mom got us for Christmas that we don't know how to work? <laughs> That'd be the fair decision of that. Why do I have to go in there? But I lost the argument, so I had to go in there. And just so you know, it wasn't a bowl issue, because any idiot with forearms can fix a bowl issue. I was working in the tank. That's the motherboard of the toilet, you guys. <laughs> People make a living off of working in the tank. They go to community college, get a certificate that says they can mess around in the tank. You don't just go in there all willy-nilly. I went in there, I flipped that lid open. How archaic is that in there? Has there never been a remodel on the toilet tank? Just one design in the 1800s? They're like, yeah, we're good forever. Let's move on. How about another gander at this? Looks like an erector set in there. Reminded me of that board game from the 90s, Mousetrap. Do you guys remember Mousetrap? That's what's in there. You hit the lever, a marble comes down. A jolly Green Giant flies over. I didn't know how it worked. I'm just staring into the tank dumbfounded, and the worst part is I can see my own reflection in the bottom of the tank, my own stupid face staring back at me. And I was hoping for like a Disney moment, like in The Lion King, like maybe the water will ripple. And there's my dad staring back at me, like, adjust the float, son. And I'd be like, oh, thanks, dad. And then he ripples away. <laughs> yeah, that did not happen. I had to go on YouTube. I had to watch a YouTube video someone else's dad made <laughs> so I could fix my toilet. You guys are fun. Don't feel bad that I grew up without a dad. I had one of those super moms. 
She taught me everything I needed to know. She actually taught me how to shave, my mom did, which was kind of weird. Uh, but I did have the smoothest legs in the eighth grade, so that was, that was tough to beat. I don't remember it ever being weird growing up without a dad. The only times it was ever weird is when I uh, would spend the night at people's houses that had a dad. I'd be in there like, who's this guy? Why is he walking around all arrogant? What's he own this place? I don't like this guy's bravado. What's his whole deal? And then he'd leave for work and my friends would be like, bye dad. And I'd be like, dude, he ain't coming back. Uh, <laughs> It's also one of my favorite jokes. Thanks for going along with it. I grew up poor. Anyone here grow up poor? Or has everyone just got money? Is that how it works? Whatever. I grew up in a single wide mobile home, which I didn't, my mom never told us we were poor. I found out at school. Cause uh, like in first grade, one of the assignments was draw your house. And my drawing was different. <laughs> Everyone else had like a pointy roof and a garage and mine was just... <laughs> it was just like a rectangle. And I threw some grass in there. And the teacher thought I was being lazy. She's like, you're not taking this assignment seriously. And I'm like, we don't really have a lawn. I just threw that in there. I took some artistic license. <laughs> Cause I was done way too early. <laughs> Nice. My, my wife's family's rich. They're loaded. My wife has an aunt that she's a multimillionaire. She bought a mansion in San Diego that she's not even going to live in for five to ten years. She just bought this mansion for later, for another time. Not now. That's hard to relate to, okay? I can kind of relate to it a little bit because sometimes I go to Subway and I get a foot long sandwich and I eat half, right? Just half. And then I save the other half for later for another time, <laughs> not now. That is a for later sandwich. You guys are fun. My wife and I, we live in a, uh, a one bedroom cottage uh, and <laughs> we've been living there for two years. But uh, when we first moved in, like the second week we were there, middle of the night, it's like two in the morning, there's a noise in the kitchen. I don't know what it was. There arose such a clatter in the kitchen. Something went down <laughs> in the kitchen. And my wife elbowed me in the ribs and she goes, baby, there was a noise. And you know what you have to do as a man. You have to get up and you have to, you know, possibly get murdered. That's what you have to do because you're in love. It's a stupid rule. I don't know who made that rule. It's a dumb rule. I don't know why we both can't lay in bed and call the cops. That sounds safer. Put it on speakerphone, teamwork. All right, one, two, three. Help! There's a noise. We don't know what it is. But I didn't do that. I got up, two in the morning, I got up. I wear contact lenses, those aren't in, so I can't see. And I'm just like, I got it, baby. And I walk around the bed, and I get to the doorway of our bedroom, and I just go. Paul? Paul? That was the noise. You ever wish you could have a redo in life? I'd love to have that one back. Maybe something a little more guttural, like, hello, welcome to Hell House. Like, something good. But that's what I learned about me. You wake me up at two in the morning, I'm very friendly for some reason. Oh, this is a private residence. It ended up being nothing, by the way. My cat made the noise. Jessica was being a cat and made noise. But I told that story to a friend of mine the next day, and he goes, you should get a gun. And I go, yeah, that would have made that a lot better. <laughs> just, just over there. Oh! <laughs> Who there? <laughs> hey, you guys have been lovely. I've been Zoltan Cassis. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much.